By seven o'clock last night, the waiting was over. A state protection group police crept into place, a window of the house was smashed, an unidentified object thrown inside. In 1999, the Lebanese-Australian crime kingpin Michael Kanan and his gang staged a 32-hour standoff with police in Sydney. The siege ended with the arrest of the gangster and a core group of the leaders of his drug-dealing empire. Two of the gang, Alan Rossini and Peter Laycock, promptly rolled over and revealed to police graphic details of Kanan's string of violent crimes. It was the beginning of the end for one of the nation's most ruthless crime lords. Michael Kanan was a, um, he was a surprise. He wasn't a, uh, a person from a, you know, a lower socioeconomic group. He was from a, a loving family. He was quite intelligent. Michael Kanan is born on May 23rd, 1975. He attends various private schools, including Christian Brothers College, and has a stable, positive, and religious upbringing. The New South Wales, um, HSC school, high school certificate score that he got was uh, what they call a TER of uh, 80. It would have uh, qualified him to, you know, to do law or any, um, any upper level university course, but um, he was certainly of above average intelligence and unfortunately he just didn't use that for the greater good. Kanan wants to join the federal police, but is ineligible due to an earlier conviction for assault and so he embarks on a career in the IT industry instead. But at the age of 22, he seeks more excitement and joins the multicultural but predominantly Middle Eastern crime gang known as DK's Boys, named after and controlled by the merciless criminal Danny Karam. The, the reality was uh, Danny Karam was a career criminal, had um, migrated to Australia from Lebanon, had a lengthy criminal history, was a man who was uh, violent by nature, had a very quick temper and was uh, feared as not only a drug dealer but a standover man in the Kings Cross area. Did his schooling in Dulwich Hill and then did an apprenticeship, went to work and then he got involved in crime, car theft and drugs, drug taking, drug dealing, possession of firearms, he got himself arrested, did some stints in prison, and then he decided instead of being reformed, as young, some young people are after their first experience of jail, he went deeper into it. Danny Karam was, um, you know, he was, a, he was a big man, he was powerfully built, he had a, uh, he had a presence certainly on the, uh, on the streets of King's Cross, he had a reputation for violence, uh, he was of um, Christian Lebanese background, he was involved in the um, the civil war in Lebanon, so he was exposed to um, to combat over there. So violence was was nothing new to um, to Danny. Your, your reputation in the underworld is everything. So if you offend uh, someone who is heavy, then you'll get it. And Danny Karam wanted to establish his reputation. Once he said something was to happen, if it didn't happen, his boys would come after you. Karam's principal activity is the distribution and sale of cocaine. His organisation has a number of tiers, which includes Michael Kanan as the second in charge, another named Alan Rossini, a handful of lieutenants and low-level street runners. These Lebanese uh, youngsters got together and decided to try to take over the drug trade. And in more recent times, there's evidence that they've been trying to take over the bikey gangs. But in, that, in those years, it was a, the drug trade in, in King's Cross was seen to be wide open for a takeover by this ethnic group. It was a significant uh, drug dealing um, operation. From uh, an ounce of cocaine, the syndicate would in fact double its money over a period of uh, one or two days, because that's the rate at which the sale of cocaine was at that time in King's Cross. So $4,000 would be turned into $8,000 in a matter of days. Around um, 
the mid 90s was when we saw that, um, that step up more towards cocaine. Prior to that, myself as a police officer, I'd never really um, come across cocaine much at all. The main um, problem drug we had was, uh, was heroin, but um, there was a significant amount of cocaine that was hitting the streets and it was quite profitable. Danny Karam gives his lieutenants, including Michael Kanan, a gold ring. It features a tiger's head with ruby eyes and a diamond in its mouth. Danny uh, demanded loyalty from, um, from his group. Uh, if there was no loyalty, there was no membership in the group. Danny had uh, rings that he had uh, made with the, uh, the letter D that he handed out to key players uh, in the group. Uh, but such was Danny's way that uh, they even had to pay for those rings at 900 bucks uh, each. Although Cram lived in the eastern suburbs, he kept, he kept the, um, his lieutenants at a distance, uh, communicating with them by mobile phone or visits. The group operated from uh, a number of safe houses, which were uh, premises rented under fictitious names, and they would use that as a base from which to go out and commit their uh, criminal activities. Um, either by using the safe house to store and uh, cut drugs and also to store and uh, take weapons from. Danny's boys um, uh, were quite conscious of uh, electronic surveillance. They wouldn't keep their mobile phones for, for too long and after a week or two the, um, they would dump a, uh, a mobile phone, connect a uh, new one. So it was a task for us to keep abreast of them in relation to what mobile phone numbers they were using because the mobile phones were, um, were the key to us to understanding what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis with the drugs. The operation is making $30,000 a week, but Danny Karam isn't sharing much of it with Kanan, Rossini or the other boys. By mid-1998, Kanan's resentment towards Karam is building and he considers killing him. Other gang members encourage him to take over DK's boys and distribute the money more evenly. Michael Kanan had a, uh, had a real problem that he was putting in all the, um, all the hard work and running the, um, the supply of cocaine in the, in, in the Kings Cross area, but ultimately all the profits were going back to Danny. Danny uh, Karam had uh, Michael Kanan and the other lads uh, collecting money for him and uh, he was going to give them a certain amount of it and he said was to bank the rest and keep it for them, but in fact Danny was grabbing the lion's share and uh, poor old Michael and others were, were doing all his dirty work for him. Kanan becomes increasingly violent. He and fellow DK's boys regularly stand over rival drug dealers in King's Cross and one row erupts into a vicious street fight. They flee the scene when police arrive. Kanan later produces a bloody knife and skites to his gang about stabbing two men during the brawl. The group um, considered they, uh, they owned King's Cross and if you wanted to um, sell drugs in King's Cross you were seen uh, either as a, an opposition and you were dealt with violently or alternately you paid them rent much the same way as if you would rent a stall at a market. If you wanted to, um, to work in that area you had to pay them the cash. If you didn't pay them the cash, you'd get violence in return. There were vast rewards of people who got on, got on top, therefore there was, you had to fight for it. Bam, bam, bam. Shot each other, fought each other to, to get on top, get the ascendancy and get the rewards. Like these people were getting around, one was very quick to draw the gun and resolve any issue or threat to him or his mates, but it was not in proportion to what was going on. And, and that was the thing with Kanan, he, he, everything was sort of out of whack. I don't know um, what went wrong with Michael. Like he certainly had the potential, he could have done uh, many things with his life. But uh, something's, uh, something's triggered uh, with him and he's gone for the gangster lifestyle. Um, you know, I've, um, I've been able to see um, you know, reports from psychologists in relation to Michael. Um, he can't even explain it himself. I don't think he was pure evil, he was, he was just a young thug. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, I mean you, you talk about the mafia in the United States and the, uh, the young toughs come out, uh, and they'll, they'll maybe Sicilian background, maybe not, and they'll decide to set themselves up in business as a, as a gangster. Uh, there's nothing evil about it, they just decided to go that way. Uh, this fellow Michael Kanan decided to go that way. 
But Canaan is gradually losing control of himself. His chosen way will soon lead to him gunning down two innocent young men. So guys, what are we going to do tonight? Have a good time? Yeah, bro. I've got some bitches lined up and then... On the night of July 17th, 1998, Kanan, Rossini and three other men drive to Cafe Extreme in the inner western Sydney suburb of Five Dock to intimidate and threaten a man about his activities in rebirthing cars. Something around Five Dock? Just going to chill out tonight, boys. You know, don't do anything stupid. The group uh, was involved in, um, you know, in rebirthing of, um, of vehicles. Back then, the uh, the vehicle of choice for the for the gang was a Subaru WRX, and um, there was a lot of rebirthing in relation to those um, those vehicles through associates of the gang. Hey Mick, you packing heat or what? Yeah, maybe I am, eh? According to Rossini, after they leave the cafe, Kanan is sitting in the back seat of the driver's side and is carrying a snub nose revolver a .22 calibre with red elastic bands wrapped around the handle. Is that the real thing? Yeah, it's the real thing. <laughs> it's not from the $2 shop, it's for real. <laughs> That's the shit, man. That's the shit. They travel along Great Northern Road towards the Five Dock Hotel. <laughs> Funny bastard. <laughs> Meanwhile, at that Five Dock Hotel, two mates, Michael Hurl and Ronald Singleton, are having a disagreement over money and the argument spills onto the footpath. Jesus! That's 50 bucks! Yeah, we'll Pay me my bloody we'll money! Hang out, right? Right? I'm sick of this! Michael, I'll get to you next this week! Singleton? Yeah, right. I owed Michael some money. And he wasn't paying it back. And he didn't look like paying it back, so... Uh, Michael said, well, that's it. I said, I'm going to get a bit of blood. Another friend, Adam Wright, tries to mediate. That night there was, I think it was one of the boys' birthdays, and I could not even tell you whose birthday it was. They were just a group of them up there having a drink and nothing else. Just a, you know, it's supposed to be a bit of a fun night with a group of boys. Don't start me, all right? Jesus! Next week it's yours. Just then, the lights at the intersection near the hotel turn red. The DK's boy's car stops and they see the two men fighting. Come on, fellas. Don't show on. Put your bloody head in, you block. Michael Kanan shoots Michael Hurl at close range, striking him in the left side of the chest. Ronald Singleton is shot in the right arm, although he's unaware that he's been hit. Adam Wright is shot in the lower abdomen. Hey, heads up, tough guy. Go, go now! Kanan makes another attempt to shoot Ronald Singleton as they drive off, but the gun is empty. Michael Hurl and Adam Wright are left fighting for their lives. Well, he was uh, shot and there was a lot of blood and he passed out. And I think some young woman from the pub ran to his assistance and uh, sort of crailed him until the uh, ambulance got there. Of course, it was all over in 30 seconds. From what I've been told, Adam got inside the pub. He walked in the pub and said, I've been shot and just dropped down. The attack was unprovoked. Four men in a car pulled up. There was a fight and shots were fired. And uh, I got a phone call off my daughter. She was at the hospital. And that's uh, when they said, cross your fingers, cross your toes. It's that bad. It severed an artery and he was 
bleeding to death. By the time we got to the hospital, he, we were told he was going to lose his right leg. The right leg was dying because of the blood that he'd lost. And you think to yourself, yeah, okay, it's only a leg, we'll deal with it. And we, you, you sit there thinking of all these things that you can do. And each time they came back to us, the story just got worse and worse. The percentage of his survival was going down. Ultimately, the wounds inflicted upon both Michael Hurl and Adam Wright are so serious that even a fit, healthy young athlete wouldn't survive. Some bullets, they go inside you and then they, once they hit there, they bounce everywhere and they rip everything on their inside. There was nothing they could do to save him. And it was one bullet. One bullet did a lot of damage. Adam just wanted to get on with his life. He loved life. He loved playing football. He loved his mates. He loved his family. Um, he wasn't perfect by any means, but he was a beautiful person. In his, the way he thought about things, uh, very caring with certain people. He had friends from all walks of life. Oh, he was happy-go-lucky. Easy to get along with, uh, very popular, you know, um, could have done a lot of things, but his life was cut too short. It was a cold-blooded killing, it was uh, uncalled for, it was um, callous, reckless and wanton. The night after the murders, Michael Canaan and Alan Rossini burn the clothes they were wearing and leave Sydney. The car they are driving is degreased and dumped. Canaan tells Rossini that he threw the gun into the Cooks River. It is never recovered. Following the shootings at Five Dock, a strike force was formed. Uh, it investigated various facets of uh, what, what had happened. Obviously, uh, uh, a vehicle had been sighted. That vehicle was subsequently reported stolen and had been uh, treated in such a way that uh, any latent fingerprints in the vehicle had been removed. Investigations obviously concentrated on connections to that vehicle. And the fact that a um, telephone had been found at the scene which gave uh, vital information as to who was connected to the vehicle that night. I think in relation to why um, Mick Canaan reacted violently, the only person who can really answer that is, um, is Mick. No one can explain it, even the guys who are closest to him. Well, they, they, he got described by the police as uh, psychopathic. And uh, he sort of just snapped like that, you know. The tribute that was paid to him through his funeral, um, I was amazed at the amount of people that were there. Um, we had all, everybody, like uh, footballers, and I'm talking big name footballers, um, high profile people, down to neighbours and young children, his young football side that he was coaching they formed a guard of honour outside the church. They were under eights. And these little kids had probably never ever been to a funeral and didn't even know what they were going to, but it was just such a beautiful tribute to him. And I think that speaks what people thought of him. Uh, Bond's a kid, great footballer. Um, good worker, hard worker. Um, oh, you know, he was the apple of my eye. You know, just, you know, like, he was the, not the perfect son, but, you know, what all fathers, you know, really want their sons to turn out to be. And he was going all right, doing his best anyway. I've lost my eldest son, my, hus my husband and I have lost our eldest son. 
My other children have lost a brother that they looked up to, uh, a mate that they looked up to. It just took a, a, a hunk out of your life. When the television program Australia's Most Wanted schedules a segment on associated Middle Eastern crime, Michael Kanaan is concerned that somebody might be able to implicate him. Go, go now. Incredibly, he and his gang members shoot up the power box and nearby power lines at their local electricity substation. The intention is to interrupt the power supply to his neighbourhood and cause a blackout as the episode goes to air. They had a, access to multiple firearms. They had uh, military assault rifles, they had shotguns, they had semi-automatic pistols, uh, and, and even firearms that I'd never seen before. About the same time, Kanan is selling a sports car to a smash repair business at suburban Yonora, but the agreement falls through. According to Rossini, Kanan is furious over the failed deal and plans a drive-by shooting in retaliation. Using shotguns, he, Rossini and two others open fire on the business knocking out windows and damaging various vehicles. The group was so quick to violence, it was, uh, it was breathtaking. They seemed to want to resolve any issue that confronted them, primarily by going for the gun first. Or bashing, or, uh, or stabbing. Really, it's, um, it's a wonder more people weren't killed. A week later, Kanan is enraged when one of his drug runners is harassed by members of a rival gang. His punishment will be to kneecap them, shoot them in the knees, but they can't be located. Finally, he gets a tip-off that one of them has been seen at a nightclub in King's Cross. The way it happened was uh, two or three carloads of um, men turned up outside the front of the, the, the nightclub, took out various types of weapons, including shotguns, um, semi-automatic pistols and uh, high-powered rifles, and basically sprayed the facade of the nightclub with, uh, with gunfire, and then fled before uh, police arrived. Ballistics examinations of cartridges found at the scene would later link those weapons to other violent crime. It was a plan they formed in their um, safe house at Paddington and just multiple shots had just fired, been fired into the door of the, uh, of the club, again trying to terrorise other, uh, other players in King's Cross. There, there was a very clear message being sent to the rival group that um, we're ready and we're prepared to take you on head on. In October 1998, in the suburb of Greenacre, Kanan confronts a man named Les Elias about a dispute over a gun. He's challenged by Elias and reacts by shooting him at least three times in the legs. Michael, Michael Kanan was very quick to respond to any threat to his name, his character, or any th physical threat upon him with, um, with violence. Uh, very quick to draw the gun. Uh, and in one particular occasion, a, a person questioned, who's Michael Kanan? His response was, well, this is who Michael Kanan is. And he immediately drew a, a weapon and shot the person. I don't know what you'd describe him as. I think he has major problems with himself. I, I don't know whether it's, I, I don't understand some of the terminology that they put towards people that have these egos that they think they can beat the system. A few days later, Edward Lee, a 14-year-old school student, and four of his friends arrive for a birthday party at Tilopia Street Punch Bowl in Sydney's southwest. The boys are unaware this 800-metre-long street is a notoriously violent Middle Eastern-operated drug trading strip. 
They are harassed by a large group of locals and a brawl erupts. One of the Tilopia Street residents, Mustafa Dib, fetches a knife from his home and kills Edward Lee, stabbing him in the back and chest. He was a, a young man just out going to a friend's place for a party. It was uh, a, a tragic set of circumstances. I, I clearly recall his mother going on TV, obviously grieving for the loss of a son um, in such really a, a, a wanton fashion. Police then went to investigate it and went to, it might have been a hundred people saw the incident and not a single person came forward. And the problem was, of course, that once you come forward and you're identified, well, you're dead. Uh, later we found out that um, the offender had um, met with Kanan and other men at uh, Bondi Beach to discuss what had happened and uh, at Kanan's insistence, um, that person and others um, then travelled to Queensland and set up an alibi, uh, thereby trying to excuse them from being in Sydney at the time of the murder. Meanwhile, unhappy with what he believes is police persecution of the Lebanese, Michael Kanan allegedly plans a drive-by shooting in revenge. According to Rossini and Laycock, just after one o'clock on the morning of November 1st, 1998, Kanan and four other men obtain a stolen vehicle and armed with nine millimeter and 0.45 caliber weapons, they spray 16 shots into the Lakemba police station. Five officers are in the foyer, but remarkably only one is injured by the flying glass. Following the, uh, a number of these violent incidents which had happened in 1998, the, uh, not only Strike Force Lancer, but a number of other strike forces which had been formed to um, investigate some of these other serious uh, crimes, came under huge pressure from police hierarchy and, and above to, uh, to stop this flow of an escalation of violence which was happening in King's Cross and in southwestern Sydney. The, the pressure was immense. Again, an extremely hard one to solve when you're looking at, um, you know, cars that aren't linked to the offenders, unregistered firearms, and you've got a, um, a staunch crew. After the shooting, the group returns to their safe house in Surrey Hills, where Kanan allegedly claims that the police will now think twice about targeting Lebanese. Oh, well, that, that, look, that was just the, the great excuse. There was an element of that mixed up in it. Uh, every migrant group who's ever come to Australia uh, following colonisation has run into prejudice. Uh, and some of the young hoodlums who come along with these migrant groups decide that they are protesting against the racist attitude in Australia. I mean, that was Ned Kelly's complaint way back. Uh, they're protesting against the brutality of the, of the regime and, the, and they also get on the groundswell of, of resentment within the migrant community of racist attitudes and they, they, call, they call themselves the champions of the people. It was not only that, but we later on found out that this uh, criminal syndicate was also trying to find out the addresses of uh, certain police that were investigating them by uh, accessing illegally information through the RTA. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it was open war, as Peter Ryan, the police commissioner, said he'd been in Northern Ireland and seen things like that, but never in a place like Australia. Well, that was a declaration of war. You reach a point where the state says, well, we, we can't have this group making war on us. We've got to do whatever we can to clean it all up. Less than a fortnight later, Michael Kanan seeks further retribution. After two Middle Eastern men are jumped and bashed by a large group of Aboriginal men in Lithgow Jail. Despite Danny Karam's opposition to the idea, Kanan allegedly arranges a random drive-by shooting of an Aboriginal housing area known as The Block in Everly Street, Redfern, on the edge of central Sydney. According to Rossini, Kanan and as many as four others fire 13 rounds into two houses and cars as they speed by in a stolen four-wheel drive. Of course, the Aboriginal people hid under beds and tried to 
escaped, no one was injured, but uh, they left a message, you do so and so to our boys and we'll inside and we'll get you outside. It was just a, you know, uh, a law unto themselves and uh, as though the Aboriginal people in the block had anything to do with the inmates in Lithgow Prison. People in the block have got enough problems of their own without having the sins of their brothers visited upon them like that. Uh, but it was just a, a case of uh, demonstrating that they're above the law and nobody can touch them. An Aboriginal flag is dropped from the car with an obscene message and the words blood for blood written on it. Kanan's next mad outrage is to get square with two former street runners who disappeared a few months earlier. When one claims to have forgotten his mobile phone number, Kanan has it tattooed on the man's forearm. The other, who owes him money, is tortured and kneecapped. That happened, he was kidnapped. He was taken to a, a, a premises where he was uh, beaten and pistol whipped. He was stabbed, he was burnt with cigarettes, uh, cut with a knife, and then uh, for the final uh, main course, he was uh, shot in the legs and then uh, taken out and dumped. Remarkably, the young man survives the ordeal, but when Michael Kanar next points his weapon, it will be with far deadlier consequences. Five months have passed since Michael Kanan killed Adam Wright and Michael Hurl outside the Five Dock Hotel. Kanan's lust for power and his murderous rage heighten as his relationship with Danny Karam worsens. Danny Karam was a, a man who was had a quick temper and um, the temper was normally attended by violence and although he was in charge of this organisation, he really treated his lieutenants quite poorly. He paid them poorly and if he thought that, that he was um, being gypped for money or that they weren't working hard enough, he would uh, either threaten them or, or pay them even, even less. This led to a, a, a level of unrest in the group, particularly with Michael Kanan. When profits started to go down, Danny started standing over them and smashing them up and threatening them. It's been seven months since Michael Kanan first suggested killing Danny Karam, and it's now a daily topic of conversation in the gang. The two argue over Kanan's use of cannabis. Kanan is eager to take over the crime business and receive a larger slice of the profits. He's also becoming increasingly worried that his boss might give him up to police over the murders at Five Dock. Michael started to share his thoughts with the other lieutenants and quickly gained a level of support amongst most of them that Danny Cram should go. They initially had inspired to have him stick himself with a, a hot shot of heroin. Um, uh, uh, Danny having been a heroin addict, but he didn't for some reason take it, so they decided they were going to kill him. In December 1998, Danny Karam arrives at the Gang City Safe House apartment in Surrey Hills to pick up two guns. He's buzzed in by Alan Rossini. about to enter the premises, Kanan and two others left via a back door to wait in ambush for him outside. Karam, um, stayed in the premises for a short time and 
then departed the premises, at which time one of the people in the premises rang those outside and said, Danny's on his way. Meanwhile, Will Dodolius is leaving a friend's house on his way to see a movie in nearby Paddington. His car is parked approximately 60 metres away. So as I got into my car, I noticed, since it was a dark street, the only um, light was coming from the RAV4 because the lights were on and the, the, the rear brake lights were on, so it was sort of lit up in that corner. Boys, Danny. Now! And as I got into the car, about to start the engine, then I heard a number of shots go off and a bunch of men scurrying around the car. Now! Alright, let's split. See you later, Danny boy. My initial reaction was just to, to get out of there as quick as I can because I already had started the car and was, the street was very quiet um, and you could hit a pin, could hit a pin drop that evening and I thought that you know, being in a white car, a loud engine, when I just started the car, I would attract attention. So my, my goal was to get out of there as quickly as possible. A total of 22 shots are fired from three different weapons. Karam receives 16 gunshot wounds in the chest and lower body and dies almost instantly. Michael Kanan boasts about the killing. He tells Alan Rossini that after he'd finished shooting Karam, he went back and shot him again. Uh, we located the um, address for the safe house, which was adjacent to the murder site. A search warrant was executed on those premises and evidence was obtained from there. Uh, certain witnesses were, uh, were pursued that we knew had attended the premises through um, other forensic evidence that, which had become available. But we kept on meeting this, um, this brick wall, this, uh, this wall of silence. We thought there was firecrackers and it wasn't, it was gunshots. This morning, heavily armed police stormed Karam's flat in a block of units next to where he was killed. I can accept that a lot of people were frightened of what may happen to them if they assisted the police, because uh, if someone was willing to kill Danny Karam, then uh, anyone else was just a mere stepping stone. At that point, Ganan seemed to think he was Billy the Kid. He could just go shoot anyone and get away with it. Well, of course, you can't. And, uh, and uh, anyone could say that, uh, could see that Ganan uh, uh, was heading for a fall. He was going to be, he was going to be caught. He'd, he'd lost control of himself. The core group of DK's boys are absent from the funeral. That upsets Karam's family and raises suspicion about their involvement in the murder. Following the murder of uh, Danny Karam, Mike Kanan uh, assumed control of the uh, DK's boys. As a group, they would operate and they continue to operate dealing in drugs in King's Cross. Uh, but following the murder of Karam too, there was they in turn were put under pressure because uh, everyone thought that they had committed that crime. And that led them to hatch another plot to throw uh, police and other crime groups off, off their scent for that. Michael Kanan now suggests killing the underworld figure Tongan Sam, who works for the Ibrahim family, major operators of nightclubs in the cross. He believes this will shift the suspicion of blame for Karam's death by making it look like a retaliatory hit. The others are less than enthusiastic about the plan, but Kanan is adamant and the search for Tong and Sam begins. Right, so if we kill Tong and Sam, it will get the cops off our asses, right? Let's just finish him off once and for all. Let's just finish him, bro. On December 22, 1998, they scour King's Cross and the nearby suburbs without success for a third consecutive night. Keep going, keep going, keep going. It's got to be here, keep going. Hey, get your head down, get your head down. Oh shit, cops, 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 go, 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 go. Shit, go! Get it, get it, get it, get it. 
Hit it! Go! Go! Get us out of here! Go! At just after three o'clock the following morning, two policemen in a marked car attempt to pull over the vehicle in which Kanan and three other companions are travelling in. Shit the behind it! Go, 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 man! Go, go, go. The men are pursued to a dead end at the White City Tennis Club on Elmer Street in Paddington, where they abandon the vehicle. Kanan and the driver are chased by Constable Patresh. Alan Rossini sprints off in a different direction. The fourth man is apprehended by Constable Fotopoulos. Rossini searches for his gun, but then escapes without locating it. The driver also gets away. Kanan stops, turns and raises his gun at Constable Patrek. Kanan then exchanges fire with Constable Fotopoulos and is wounded several times in the process. Drop the gun now! Don't move! Ironically, at one point, Kanan literally shoots himself in the foot. Don't move! The person that was wrestled to the ground was uh, found to be carrying a uh, magazine from a semi-automatic pistol and two other firearms were found nearby, obviously having been discarded by the occupants of the vehicle. And some of those weapons were ballistically linked to the murder of Danny Karam and other shootings. Mick Kanan didn't have to uh, didn't have to shoot. He had the opportunity. He could have run. He could have fled. He could have dumped his guns. He could have done many other uh, many other things. But what he did was absolute cowardice. We had a police officer that was climbing a chain mesh fence, and uh, he was stuck. He was like a spider in a web. He had nowhere to go. Mick turned around and then started firing shots into him. It was just absolute cowardice. It was a bloody gun battle in Sydney's exclusive east only ending after 25 rounds had been fired and three men lay wounded, one of them a police officer. Kanan was arrested at the, at the scene, conveyed to St Vincent's Hospital where he uh, was kept under police guard. He is charged with intent to murder and other firearms offences. The two constables involved in this incident, Rush Cutters Bay, acted bravely and admirably uh, to um, basically pursue uh, people in, 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 in the darkness uh, and then having been fired upon and respond to that fire was uh, very credible on their part. Kanan's injuries will leave him in a wheelchair for the next three years. But amazingly, he is a free man. During the first five months of 1999, Michael Kanan is out on bail awaiting trial, but remains in frequent contact with the major players from his drug ring. During this time, police mount a surveillance operation on their activities. I kind of applied it to the strategy that the Americans used against Al Capone when they got him for taxation offences. They couldn't get him for what, uh, what, he, was, uh, what uh, he was ultimately up to with bootlegging but they got him for what they could. And that was our strategy with, uh, with Mick Kanan and his gang, get them for what they could and just see what comes uh, out of that. By concentrating on that business, we were able to gain a brief of evidence on Kanan and the other lieutenants in DK's boys, in which we were able to put a serious drug conspiracy charge on them. And an operation was then undertaken to arrest all those people. 150 police swooped on homes across Sydney's southwest early this morning. Nine people arrested for a string of violent crimes over the past year. When Strike Force Lancer moved to arrest the principals of DK's boys for their um, drug distribution um, business, uh, a, a large operation was put in place, involved about 200 police across various premises in, this, in the Sydney area. Uh, a number of the people were arrested without incident. However, when the search warrant was uh, about to be executed on the Canaan premises at Belfield, uh, Michael, who was inside with some of his family, 
and uh, associates uh, barricaded them inside themselves inside the building and, and, and virtually created a siege situation. Uh, that siege went on for about 30 hours before he finally surrendered to police. On June 2nd, 1999, Michael Kanan, Alan Rossini, Rabir Mawas, Wasim al -Assad and Peter Laycock are arrested and charged with conspiracy to supply a commercial quantity of cocaine. Uh, that offence was quite significant. It carried a, um, a life sentence and um, certainly as a result of um, a number of persons uh, realising the position they were in, we, we got some witnesses out of that. In return for full immunity, Peter Laycock and Alan Rossini agree to actively cooperate in criminal proceedings against a number of fellow gang members, predominantly Michael Kanan. The evidence uh, of the witnesses or the people involved in DK's boys who subsequently gave evidence was, was absolutely pivotal and uh, essential to the prosecution and gave uh, a lot of credence to the brief of evidence to have uh, information or evidence coming from someone who was at the scene of a lot of these crimes but not directly involved in pulling the trigger was um, very strong and very cogent evidence. Using them um, as witnesses was uh, the only way that we would have got um, the murder convictions that we've got. In September 1999, Kanan, already in custody, is charged with the murders of Michael Hurl, Adam Wright and Danny Karam. But there's a sudden, shocking twist in the proceedings. Controversial magistrate Pat O'Shane discharges Kanan from standing trial for the attempted murders of Constables Patrek and Fotopoulos. In her words, there is not a shred of evidence which gives rise to any factual or reasonable cause on the part of the police to chase these young fellows on this particular night. This effectively renders the arrest unlawful. It's a devastating ruling for the police team who had put their lives at risk in chasing and apprehending Kanan. There's an immediate public outcry over the magistrate's ruling and the Director of Public Prosecutions uses its power to indict Kanan. They had no idea what they were dealing with that night. They, they had a, a vehicle which was acting, um, well, the occupants in the vehicle acting in a very suspicious fashion. If they'd just been driving normally, no attraction would have been made and therefore the incident wouldn't have happened. These four rotters are out doing some, out after mischief, out after trouble and uh, someone had to notice them and who better to notice them than the police and question as to who they are. <laughs> How about I show you, kid? Kanan's initial trial for the five dock shooting is aborted. But on July 8, 2001, he's found guilty and later sentenced to two life terms for the murder of Michael Hurl and Adam Wright. He also receives 25 years for the malicious wounding of Ronald Singleton. I never understood why they never put him on the stand, because if he, he was proclaiming his innocence, he never got up and defended himself. Um, there were stories in the court case of how he was never there. He had people get up on the stand and lie. Um, to me, if you knew you weren't there and you had witnesses, you would bring them forward at the committal hearing, not at the trial. He never did that. Well, I got a feeling I knew he was as guilty as sin because he couldn't look me in the eye. And it's just a, a feeling that you sense yourself. The general public reaction to, to the murders at Five Dog was one of um, abhorrence. It was uh, just a wanton killing. Uh, what it was was a, an altercation, a private altercation that had been impinged by these people who weren't involved and from a, a, a simple argument on the footpath that it escalated into the shooting of three people resulting in the death of two. It was. Uh, uh, quite clearly unbelievable. 
Several years later, Kanan and his co-conspirators are found guilty of Danny Karam's murder. Kanan is sentenced to a third life sentence without parole. He receives a further three years and four months imprisonment for being an accessory after the fact to Edward Lee's death. He later appears in the district court in relation to the Everly Street Redfern drive-by shooting, but the case is not pursued. Another two years go by and Kanan's appeals for his convictions and sentences for the five dock and Danny Karam murders are all dismissed. In 2006, Kanan is found guilty of malicious wounding with intent as a result of the White City incident and is sentenced to a further 12 years jail, providing belated vindication for constables for Topolis and Patresh. Finally, in 2007, he's convicted for the shooting of Les Elias. In sentencing him to 10 years in prison, Judge Stephen Norrish describes Kanan as a dangerous man and compares the incident to a scene from the movie Goodfellas. In the late 1990s, I can say that Michael Kanan was probably the worst problem that the New South Wales Police would have had um, at that time. And if it ultimately wasn't for his shooting at the White City Tennis Courts and the, the, um, his later arrest for these and other matters, uh, God only knows how many people would have been killed. My view is that Michael Kanoa was a sociopath. He showed no remorse for what he did. He uh, wanted to resolve every issue that seemed to confront him with, with violence or firearms. And uh, a lot more bodies would be on the street if he hadn't been uh, locked away. Michael Kanan was sent to Goulburn's Supermax Jail in southern New South Wales. He's now exhausted all avenues of appeal and will die in custody. Although Kanan and his hapless punks were locked away or entered witness protection, King's Cross still had other identities of Middle Eastern descent. One of them, who was also given a significant jail term, was Bill Bayer, convicted of supplying drugs and perverting the course of justice. Others made their fortunes as nightclub czars, although today, stricter alcohol licensing has dimmed the edgy, all-night reputation of the cross. A lot of the vice and drug dealing that once fueled its bloody street violence has oozed out into the Sydney suburbs. The kings of the cross have been dethroned replaced by other emerging crime gangs, some sinister outlaw bikies, and the usual thugs on the make.